All right, so this is the 32nd lecture in a series of lectures on creating an international sustainable civilization. So this lecture is about Buddhism. Yeah, you know, it's quick and easy, not too complicated, uh, just recognizing the patterns. And so it starts out with a section on Buddha's childhood and his coming of age. And when I read this in Houston Smith's book, The World Religions, I thought of Jesus right away. I also thought of <coughs> psychology, because the psychologists say that it's in your late 20s that a, a lot of things come together. Your brain sort of comes to some sort of closure, although you can always, you're always growing. It's just that. Um, there is this process where it sort of comes to a, a plateau. It just doesn't stop there. But so, and then when I raised my children, um, I wanted them to go out and have their odyssey years. You go to college, you do internships during college. Then you go out and you do some maybe NGO work, um, non-religious missionary work or religious pluralist missionary work or some kind of do-gooder work, work that is improving the quality of life for people but doesn't pay very well. You you don't save money, but you don't lose money. You just sort of meet people, figure out what you really like to do, figure out your calling. And so all of them spent from 22 age 22 to about 28. And then they said, okay, mom, I know what I want to do. And then they went to grad school and now they're all doing things that they think are meaningful. It fits with what is it I'm good at? Uh, what's very satisfying to me and what does the world need and how do I match those? So, so Jesus and Buddha, um, came of age, they had this experience of revelation, religious experience, conversion. They turned around from living sort of a normal life, although it wasn't always, it wasn't really normal. It's just that they became self-consciously aware of their real calling in life at that point. Um, all right, so Buddha most of these religious icons were poor, born poor, or middle class. Confucius was poor. Um, Buddha, though, was the son of a, a prince in a small little fiefdom, but he, a Hindu king, sorry. There were many small kingdoms, sorry. Before he was born, the Brahmin priest said this would be a special child. He would either become a political leader and conqueror, or he would be a religious leader who redeemed his people. All right. Well, what do you think his parents wanted? <laughs> they wanted him to be powerful. So they raised him in the temple with every kind of pleasure and temptation. So he really would care about money and power, right? They tried to habituate him for that, which would be the opposite of Aristotle. But I mean that, you know, that's the point, is they tried to corrupt him. Every day, though, he would take a walk away from the temple. He had to get some exercise. So during these walks, he, uh, he was most influenced by four sites, the four passing sites that exposed him to human suffering. He saw someone who was sick. He saw someone who was aging. He saw someone who was dead. And then he saw a monk in a state of meditation. And when he saw that, he thought, that's me. That's what I want. He decided at that moment, he wanted to renounce the world and become a monk. So all of his parents' conditioning really didn't help. He left home in the night in search of enlightenment. For the next six years, 
he focused on three paths to enlightenment. He learned the wisdom of the Hindu tradition. He memorized the holy books and the rituals. And we've heard this story before. He tried asceticism, extreme self-denial, almost starved himself to death. He gave it up in favor of what Houston Smith calls the middle way. Well, <laughs> not too much, not too little. That's right back to Aristotle. So, you know, you could be a Buddhist and say, and then say, gee, I read Aristotle, and Aristotle has the mean between extremes. Oh, well, that's Buddha's middle way. And um, these occurred, this sort of activity of coming of age, this, these iconic characters uh, lived in approximately the same time. So that's kind of interesting. That's the axial age where communities became complex enough that consciousness had this leap and it happened in different places. But that was, there's the primordial. At that, at that moment, the ethics, the ethos, the basic virtues were formed in each of these places and the basic lessons to learn and the basic distinctions. Um, and so that's why it shouldn't be surprising that they're very similar. He And then the third way was rigorous thought and concentration. So if he's raised Hindu, that would be it, right? Um, the path of reflection, he's learning the wisdom. The path of um, uh, self-denial, the path of rigorous thought would be the yogi. Um, then he sat down under a bow tree, vowing he would meditate until he reached nirvana or liberation. All right. While he was meditating, the evil one, Maya, came to him to tempt him. First, he sent Kama, a woman, to trigger the god of desire. Second, she sent Mara, the lord of death, to trigger fear. Third, she challenged his right to do this, claiming he was trying to make himself a god. All right, so how does that, that ties back to Aristotle or to our basic survival drives. What are our basic set drives? Pleasure and fear. Um, and so psychologically, I would think that if somebody does sit down and try to get released from those two basic drives, they will, right, kick in even more uh, rigorously until they give up. It's This happens when a person doesn't eat for a, a long time or a while. They get really hungry for a while. And then if they just don't eat after a while, your stomach just sort of gives up and forgets, at least for a little while, and then it will come back. But but you can understand that psychologically, you probably can measure it in some kind of way. And then fear also, that um, deciding not to be afraid will trigger a fear instinct until you just refuse to let the cortisol kick in, say no. So with pleasure, it'd be dopamine, and with fear, it'd be cortisol. There's a body chemistry for all of that. Um, and then he ignored her, right? He challenged her right to do it. He went into a state of meditation. And then after 49 days, he had this liberation. So the book, the Bhagavad Gita also has that moment in chapter nine, when Arjuna sees the Brahman, all of reality in one piece, in one whole. So Maya tempted him one more time why don't you just end your life now in a state of nirvana instead of returning to human life and suffering? And he said, there will be some who understand. And he began teaching his life redeeming message. So all of these leaders, Jesus, Muhammad, whatever, 
they did want people to learn the the lesson, the way of life. They didn't want to be worshipped. They weren't in it for power or fame. They just knew if people could just learn these techniques, these exercises, or learn to love God, love your neighbor, they would be so much happier and they would flourish. And this is what we're meant to do. We're designed to live this way if I can only communicate it. So if I can only pass it down. So they did, that's all they wanted to do was pass it down. And then they were worried about whether anybody understood this. Socrates was worried at the end too. Did anybody understand the life of the mind? What the way of life I live? And it was dubious because his, his closest philosophical friends were in the room and it didn't seem like any of them got it. And then he dies. And then again, you wonder, Fido is telling the story after a number of years after he died. Did Fido really get it or not? Fido started a philosophy school, but as you can't tell, you know, what did he teach in Fido's school? Did he understand Socrates? So, you know, they all worried about that. They didn't worry about their egos. They worried about this way of life because it's a way to connect to the universe. It's not relative. You can't replace it. There could be other spiritual leaders but they would have the same basic message because the universe hasn't changed. Um, all right, so that was his motive was to pass it down. So, you know, my motive in doing these lectures is to try to pass down the legacy of ancient Greek civilization in general. And now it's the legacy of these <clears throat> ancient texts without wanting to revert to the good old days, but without thinking that if we just have more robots and more artificial intelligence and more technology and more social engineering and more re-engineering of nature, we'll just totally be saved. There's, there's no way, I don't think. So that's why I wanna pass the ideas, this particular way of approaching the problem. Okay, Buddha started an order of monks. He taught for 45 years, but he did not have one set doctrine. The goal is not a set of principles, but a way of life. Aristotle, even though Aristotle had this huge list of virtues, it's not a doctrine. It just tells you, here's all the kinds of situations you'll get into. Here's the way to overreacting, underreacting, you have to deliberate to figure out, well, what is an overreaction in this situation? What is an under, people accuse each other. Well, what is the best judgment? So virtue isn't a logos, it's a way of life. So Buddha thought that, um, Muhammad thought that. Some of his main concepts were no soul, all there is is energy, analogy with the wind or with a flame. So uh, quote in the Bible, the wind blows where it will and you do not hear the sound of it. And you, you, you feel it, right? You hear the sound, but it um, you do not know where it comes or where it goes. And then the image of a flame is the light of the mind in the Greek. Um, Hestia's flame. And then um, Hermes takes the flame from heaven to earth. And the whole idea of someone being bright or somebody, ah, the light went on. Oh, I could see what it was I'm supposed to do. Um, a certain kind of seeing that's uh, the seeing of the mind or spiritual seeing. At this point, the word spirit and the word mind really come together quite a bit. Um, so uh, the goal is to be in touch with a force or energy, create positive karma, don't cling to anything in this world. He created a ritual of meditation 
that would enable anyone to achieve nirvana. Okay, so. Um, so the way of living Buddha worked out and taught was based on his own empirical study. So, I mean, there's empirical data here. He uses modern scientific technique, but he uses it in the service of spirituality or to put it in an Aristotelian way, he, he unifies the moral virtues culminating in practical wisdom, knowing how to live with the intellectual virtues of empirical study and creating a science of meditation, breathing, how to sit, um, what to think about, which, you know, evidence-based path to get to this very peaceful, integrated frame of mind. Today, Westerners with sophisticated brain scan equipment and other methods of proof, they provide evidence that these techniques lead to an integration of the primitive drives close to the brainstem and our daily lives. The goal is the integration of body, mind, and spirit. So Houston Smith, describes the characteristic of Buddhist meditations this way. They're empirical. They're based on personal experience. It's scientific. It's based on lived experience, cause-effect studies. They're pragmatic, based on problem solving. How do you solve the problem of people being consumed by fear or jealousy or pride or lust? They're therapeutic. The goal is suffering and the end of suffering. So the point is all of these irrational passions trigger suffering. They're part of suffering for us. They don't make us happy. They're psychological. They're, it provides effective coping mechanisms, right? They're egalitarian. They're available to anyone, regardless of their caste, their race, and their gender. So this is very similar to Gandhi. So Gandhi knows he's imitating Buddha in relation to the Brahmins. Okay? They're individual. Each person works out their own liberation through personal diligence. And I know the tradition that I grew up in, John Wesley, um, said you have to work out your own salvation with diligence. And he assigned people in his church to meet every week in small groups to talk about how do you combine your faith, scripture, the tradition, how have people applied the, the scripture, uh, reason, and um, experience, your own experience. You have to synthesize those. You have to talk to other people about how you're doing this. And then you work out your own uh, salvation. And so in Buddhism, it's this liberation. And in, in I think Methodism is more like um, Aristotle because it's pretty action-oriented in all the decisions you make. You've made last week and you make this week. Okay, there's two schools of Buddhist thought. One is the monks, um, and they support that this is the main message of Buddha because Buddha was a monk. And then the other branch is our people that return to the world, and they argue that, well, Buddha had a chance to just die, and he returned to the world. But in Hinduism, this would be the path of reflection or the path of the yogi on the one hand and the path of the heart and the path of action on the other hand. So, okay, like Jesus, Socrates, Confucius, Muhammad, Gandhi, and many other prophets, Buddha exposed the corruption of the religious leaders of his day who were the Hindu Brahmins. So now we're back to those six characteristics of religion that Houston Smith listed, and I had in the first lecture on the prophets. Buddha rejected the caste system and the claim that the Brahmins were destined to be spiritual leaders, right? He rejected all of that. 
rituals, Buddha replaced rituals with meditative practices. So the Brahmins did not have control of these rituals and rites. So before that, you had to have, you know, a Brahmin had to baptize you or confirm your rite of passage or be there for a wedding or whatever. And Buddha rejected all that. All you have to do is meditate. Suffering and the end of suffering through your own meditative practices and then living out of the frame of mind that you can get yourself into through meditation. Speculation. The Brahmins claim to have secret knowledge because of their extensive education. And Buddha rejected any secret knowledge, focused on a way of life, just like the rest of them. Tradition, the Brahmins knew Sanskrit and used this to intimidate the masses, claiming only they could, only they could pass down the accumulated wisdom of the tradition. Buddha rejected any such esoteric knowledge because the goal, liberation, is not a doctrine or any external documents or behaviors. The goal is internalized. It's written on your heart. It's not a matter of whether you know Sanskrit or not. Grace, the Brahmins preached fatalism to the poor, claiming they're poor because of their previous incarnations, right? So that's where, the idea of a young soul, right? I talked about that. You know, it makes some sense. 40-year-old men uh, buying hot rods or divorcing their wives and marrying somebody 20 years younger. Just letting it go and say it's a different. Or if you're born and untouchable, say just it's because of your previous incarnations, just wait. And if you obey and you're compliant, you'll get a better incarnation next time, right? So Buddha rejected all of that, told everybody they could achieve liberty. This is very radical, completely destroys the legitimacy of the religious establishment. Um, all the Baptists, I mean, there were Protestants who, I mean, uh, Luther said the priesthood of all believers, you don't have to, the priest doesn't have to mediate. Each person has their own conscience. Uh, but Luther became more conservative. Either you're a Christian, either you're a Catholic or a Lutheran. So Germany split into those two. But still, the Protestant Reformation is kept dividing and dividing because everybody said, well, I have my own conscience. I have to follow my own conscience. So Buddha rejected any kind of authority. People have their own path to liberation and mystery. So the oppressed masses became obsessed with the occult and escapism, forces outside of their control that harmed them. And Buddha rejected all of that and told them they have agency. They can get in touch with the Atman and they can live out of that power and they can have their own agency. The Brahmins are just abusing them. Okay, Buddhism and women's rights. So in theory, Buddhist meditation is egalitarian. Women can achieve nirvana. Buddha's aunt was the first woman um, was who ordained a monk. Buddhist monasteries were the first to institutionalize an independent religious life for women in the history of world religions. In spite of this, <laughs> a document was written, eight important rules. It's attributed to Buddha, but written way after Buddha died. And it's imposed onto nuns. It demands subservience to nuns, of nuns to priests. Buddhist scriptures were written down 400 years after the death of Buddha, so the authors clearly corrupted Buddha's teachings. They had their own agenda. And, it, you know, who accepted this? Who decided to institutionalize this? So happens over and over. The original spirit of a tradition, what becomes a tradition, then the corruption of the tradition, especially the original 
uh, leader, spiritual icon was not sexist and or way less sexist than the culture and yet the culture, the representatives it gets institutionalized into a sexist culture and all of a sudden it becomes sexist in the name of Buddha, in the name of whatever. Okay, the attitude toward nature is important, although you can anticipate this. There's no way somebody with that kind of meditative goal is, is going to want to destroy the natural world. That would definitely be a way to create bad karma. So if your goal is good karma, you have to stay in sync with the natural world. There are cycles of evolution and dis dissolution. There are natural processes that are affected by the morals of humans, which they are. <laughs> We're wicked and greedy and we are interrupting um, the cycles of evolution, the natural cycles of, na of nature. The layers of, there are different layers of natural forces. So there's physical, biological, right? Physical forces, rocks, inert, non-living things, biological, psychological, moral, and causal. So our psyches are just another layer of the energy of the universe. Humans and nature are brought bound together in a reciprocal causal relationship. Um, and there's a mutual interaction. We can go down, when we go down, there's a moral degeneration. Then there's a change of heart and a moral regeneration. Um, when we go down, when we degenerate, we wound nature more. And when we regenerate, we have more respect and we develop more integration, integrity with nature. The world, nature and humankind, stands or falls with the type of moral force at work. Greed leads to famine, sorrow, and negative consequences. Clearly that's happening now because we have the technology to be able to feed every person on the planet. And yet there's starvation. And it seems to be coming. It, I don't think it's declining. It might be, but we have too much, too much famine and it's caused by evil, not by some sort of external um, inevitable, necessary, natural force. It's our own choice. Ignorance leads to an epidemic. Humans have to understand nature in order to be able to utilize natural resources and live harmoniously with nature. So in case of a pandemic, part of that is because we have disrupted the natural cycles. Um, partly there will be more um, outbreaks of tropical diseases in the Southern US in larger areas of the world because of our disruption, because of climate change and temperatures rising. Um, so it's ignorance in the sense of the ignorance about taking our place in the world there's also ignorance in the fact that people did not want to know, and then they did not want to know about the vaccines and why they should get one, how it works. Uh, that would be a case where we use our understanding of nature to bring ourselves back into a natural condition of flourishing. Nature wants us to flourish, but not by destroying nature, by integrating. If you survive only by destroying nature, then you will commit suicide. It will get worse. A gentle, non-aggressive attitude is best. Loving kindness, not only best in some detached moral point of view, but actually best in a purely natural, um, feedback loops between nature and culture. Hatred leads to violence. 
moral degeneration leads to a few people who pick up the pieces and create a moral regeneration. The world is led by mind. Man and nature are interdependent. So we have to have a microcosm in the macrocosm. And the world is led by mind. This would be the monist position, Aristotle's pure energy, energia and his uh, unmoved mover, right? Religion and globalization. This is from the book, The Justice Men or Women. Financial support from the International Monetary Fund and World Bank has been focused on cities making consumer goods for the privileged in developed and developing nations. So even then, the exploitation of nature within a country was for the higher standard of living of the rich within the country and of the rich living in cities in a country as opposed to the rural places where the food is actually grown and where a lot of these products or the, the ingredients for the products are created, are made. Rural areas were given over to agribusinesses that plant food for export, use fertilizers, pollute the air, water, erode the land, cut down forests and take minerals, etc. Seeds are sold by corporations, uh, it's illegal for farmers to keep their own seeds and plant for the next year. Um, farmers get in debt to multinational companies. Governments run to wealthy elites who control elections, appoint relatives and friends, restrict labor organizing, displace the anger of the poor by promoting prejudice against religious minorities. So this happens again and again. And this book was written quite a while ago. So I do want to use books that were written a while ago so that people know, like we could know this, we could have known this, we should be calling this out over and over until it stops. Uh, but we haven't been doing that. So I, I had an earlier, a uh, lecture right before the section on the prophets about the toxic culture in the US and how developing countries, their farmland is exploited to create the ingredients for processed food. Processed food is carefully designed to make people addicted. Obesity is a horrible problem in the US creating this incredible need for healthcare products, services. And so we get into debt. We have no money to, to donate to the World Bank or International Monetary Fund. We don't give developing countries seed money for sustainable development projects. And it just, it just snowballs downward um, until you have to stop. We have to change the paradigm. The religion of the market. Roads are built into rural areas to bring food to the global market, not to bring food to the people in the rural areas. Roads also bring technology, TV, etc. This was before cell phones, and so cell phones definitely make this worse. The shopping malls are a new religion. The cell phones you know, show you all these products that you're supposed to covet, you're supposed to want, you're supposed to be jealous of people who have these things. Ritual practices, okay, so you start really a new religion. There's ritual practices, um, uh, demotion sacrifice makes your anxiety worse. So your status depends upon what you have you make sacrifices to get this stuff and you're anxious when you can't get it. And that promotes mental illness. That's where we're exporting our toxic culture and destroying the mental health of people around the world. We need programs for land reform, microcredit and public health. We need a religious orientation 
that rejects injustice and is activists. So what have we got? More recently, we have Black Lives Matter to call out racism. And we have Fridays for the Future with Greta Thunberg. And that's about climate justice. So uh, Buddhism should definitely, people should link their commitment to Buddhism to religious pluralism, humanitarianism, unity and diversity, deliberating around a table with members of other traditions, uh, government involvement in supporting sustainable pro products and education for a sustainable future, and then sustainability. So all of the development, the statecraft that moves people into a middle class, that taxes the rich to create a middle class, that all needs to be also sustainable. And that's very consistent with the Buddhist worldview. Um, I know that um, the, the colleagues I know who are Buddhist say that, well, Buddhist is just a, a lot of practices. You practice loving kindness. You practice detaching yourself from the outside world. Um, and you can be a Christian Buddhist or a Methodist Buddhist. I know that when Star Wars was big, um, George Lucas or some, the name of that guy anyway, his son was interviewed and they asked him, well, what's your worldview? Uh, and he said, oh, I think we're Methodist Buddhist. <laughs> and since I was raised Methodist, I sort of get that. You could be Methodist Buddhist. Uh, it's consistent with the way of life because John Wesley said, if your heart is as my heart, give me your hand. He was fed up with the Church of England, which was entrenched in wealth and power and status and also in doctrines that you had to follow, rituals, you know. And so Methodism has a name because they had different methods. So they went out, they were activists, they went out and prayed with poor people who were getting hung for stealing bread to feed their families. They were exposing all the injustices, fighting against them. So it's a long story, uh, but you can be a Methodist Buddhist. Um, all right, religious pluralism. 